because it's Christmas, we're going to do a Christmas sermon, but we're not going to do, we're not going to be in like the normal part of the Christmas story. We're going to be in the part of the Christmas story that usually um, gets neglected. Um, and, and that is um, the story of Zechariah and Elizabeth. So, um, I'm going to read to you. It's, it's, it's a long passage. Follow along because um, it's all going to matter. Okay, so starting in verse 5. When Herod was king of Judea, there was a Jewish priest named Zechariah. He was a member of the priestly order of Abijah, and his wife, Elizabeth, was also from the priestly line of Aaron. Zechariah and Elizabeth were righteous in God's eyes, careful to obey all the Lord's commandments and regulations. They had no children because Elizabeth was unable to conceive, and they were both very old. One day, Zechariah was serving God in the temple, uh, for his order was on duty that week. As was the custom of the priests, he was chosen by lot to enter the sanctuary of the Lord and burn incense. While the incense was being burned, a great crowd outside stood, stood outside to pray. While Zechariah was in the sanctuary, an angel of the Lord appeared to him, standing on the right of the incense altar. Zechariah was shaken and overwhelmed with fear when he saw him, but the angel said, Don't be afraid, Zechariah. God has heard your prayer. Your wife, Elizabeth, will give you a son, and you are to name him John. You will have great joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the eyes of the Lord. He must never touch wine or other alcoholic drinks. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before his birth, and he will turn many Israelites to the Lord their God. He will be a man with the spirit and power of Elijah. He will prepare the people for the coming of the Lord. He will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children, and he will cause those who are in rebellion to accept the wisdom of the godly. Zechariah said to the angel, How can I be sure this will happen? I am an old man now, and my wife is also well along in years. Then the angel said, I am Gabriel. I stand in the very presence of God. It, um, it was he who sent me to bring you this good news. But now, since you didn't believe what I said, you will be silent and unable to speak until the child is born. For my words will certainly be fulfilled at the proper time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah to come out of the sanctuary, wondering why he was taking so long. When he finally did come out, he couldn't speak to them. Then they realized from his gestures and his silence that he must have seen a vision in the sanctuary. When Zechariah's week of service in the temple was over, he returned home. Soon afterward, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and went into seclusion for five months. How kind the Lord is, she exclaimed. He has taken away my disgrace of having no children. Okay. So here's, here's the deal. Uh, during the days of Jesus, um, the priests, there are only a few priests who worked in the temple all of the time, right? They were actually, uh, uh, they were in control of the temple. That was like their full-time gig. And actually, they became quite wealthy and they were really corrupt. But there were all kinds of people who were in the line of Aaron. Remember Moses and Aaron way back in the Bible, right? And, and these were priests who were hereditary priests, right? They, because of their family lineage, they were priests. And so what, what they would do is two weeks a year, they would go and serve at the temple. So they had like regular jobs. And then like two weeks a year, they would go serve their time in the temple and help run things. Does that make sense? So, I mean, it's, it's, I don't know, almost like, like the national guard or something for priests. Now, most people in Israel I mean, they were Jews, and kind of being Jews was important to them, but most people really didn't believe that God was going to move anymore because the days of God speaking and God moving were like long gone. 
It was 400 years since any prophet had spoken in Israel. 400 years. That's like the pilgrims landing um, at Plymouth, right? I mean, it's a long, long time ago for all of them. And so all that stuff, like prophets and God speaking and miracles and messiahs and all that kind of stuff, it's just like way in the background. But, and so because of that, a lot of these people, I mean, they weren't really careful to keep God's law. They weren't really serious about it. But Zechariah and Elizabeth, they were serious about God's law. They were like real believers. They were really waiting on the Lord. And Elizabeth was barren. This is like hardcore because to be barren was like a really heavy thing. I mean, actually, I mean, even today, right? There's people who want to have kids and they have difficulty having kids. And it's a very, very heavy thing. It's, it's a deep, deep birth on someone. But back then it was even deeper birth, right? I mean, this idea like, like what's wrong with you? Like what kind of sin did you commit against God that God hasn't opened your womb? And like Zechariah, I mean, how have you displeased God that God, that God is not giving you any sons? And when y'all are decrepit, who's going to take care of you, right? So they were like, you know, they were like under this. But even though they had this burden, they still believed and followed the Lord. They had like bad stuff happened and they still followed the Lord. Do you, do you get what I'm saying? Okay. So probably God allowed her to be barren as a sign of Israel, right? Because Israel, in a sense, was kind of like barren. So, the dealio here is that Zechariah, um, they all like choose by lots to see who's going to get to do like the biggest deal, and that is to go in inside the temple, inside the holy place that nobody's allowed, and offer a sacrifice on the altar of incense. Okay? This is like a great honor, and some priests would go their whole lives, and they would never be drawn. And once you're drawn, you never draw again. Okay, So like you, you can do it only once, and he's drawn, he is old, um, and he's going to go in and do this. Now, here's what he's supposed to do. Now, all these people have gathered at the temple. This is an evening sacrifice. People are showing up and they're praying outside the temple. And the priest is in front of the people. And then he goes in. He goes into the altar of incense where nobody can see him. He offers the incense. I think they can see that the smoke come up. And then he comes out and he pronounces a blessing on them so that they can go. Does that make sense? Right? It's just like Pastor Gabe or Pastor Zach at the end of the service. Um, we finished. We were major. Yeah, that's right. Totally, that's right. Right. totally all right. So, yeah, Pastor Gabe, Pastor Zach, they, they give a benediction at the end. That's that blessing. That's a priestly blessing um, at the end of the service. Now, while they are outside, they are praying for something called the Day of the Lord. So they're praying that God would come to Israel and God would set Israel free and that the Messiah would come. And the Messiah would deliver them. And they're praying for the day of the Lord. They're saying these prayers. And then he goes in to offer the incense. And the, and the smoke of the incense goes up. And that symbolizes our prayers going up to God. Okay? So you follow me? You kind of get the situation here? This is like people show up every day for this. It's not real long. Um, and here, so, you know, the priest goes in. He goes in and disappears from view. He's only going to be gone for a few minutes, right? He disappears from view, and he goes up, and he's offering the incense, and it's like, there's an angel standing at the side of the altar of incense, um, which, but every time the angels are not like babies playing harps, right? Apparently, they're terrified because every time anyone sees an angel, they're terrified. And Zechariah is terrified. So always the first thing he says is, don't be afraid. Okay? And then he says, your prayer is answered. Now, what prayer? You're going to have a son. Oh, that prayer. My personal prayer is going to be answered. My personal prayer 
that I've wanted a son, so this prayer is going to be answered. And he says, and many will rejoice at his birth. Why? Because he, to paraphrase, is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. He's going to turn people's hearts back to God. So, Zechariah, not only is your prayer answered, their prayer out there is answered. The prayer that you're offering the incense for, it's all answered. Your prayer, their prayer, it's all coming to pass. And it says, you're going to have a son. Zechariah's like, um, whoa. Uh, so, I don't know if you noticed, because you're an angel and all, maybe you're not that familiar with humans, but like, I am decrepit. I am a seriously old dude. And I don't know if you see my wife, but I'm not one of those guys who married the young woman, right? My wife is decrepit like I am. I mean, really, how's this going to happen? And the angel says, so Zechariah is sincere, but he has a hard time understanding. He says, how am I to know this is going to happen? And the angel says, because I am Gabriel. Only two angels named in the Bible, Gabriel and Michael. I am Gabriel, and God sent me to you. God himself sent me to you. Now, at that point, like Zechariah, probably this feeling just totally washed over him of like fear and awe because the last time we hear from Gabriel is in Daniel chapter 9. And do you know what Gabriel said? At the time of the evening sacrifice, same exact time, Gabriel said the Messiah will come in 70 weeks of years. So the last time that Gabriel spoke, he said the Messiah is coming and it's going to be 490 years from now. And now Gabriel shows up and says, it is now time and your boy is going to prepare the way for the Messiah. But because you did not believe, you're not going to speak. And so he comes. And so Gabriel, he's been in there a long time. People are like talking. What, what's happened? He's an old dude. Maybe he dropped or something. And then here he comes out, and he's like, mm -hmm. and he can't speak. He can't give the blessing. He can't finish what he's supposed to do. And they go home, and Elizabeth becomes pregnant. Now, that's not the end of the story. Because the end of this story is the absolute end of the Gospel of Luke. Check this out. The Gospel of Luke begins at the temple and ends at the temple. So if we go to the very end of the Gospel of Luke, what do we find? Luke 24. Let's do the last two verses in Luke. So Jesus has risen from the dead. He has spent time with his disciples, and he's going to ascend to heaven. So it says, Jesus led them to Bethany, and lifting his hands to heaven, he blessed them. While he was blessing them, he left them and was taken up to heaven. So they worshipped him and then returned to Jerusalem filled with great joy and they spent all their time in the temple praising God. Jesus gives the blessing that was delayed with Zechariah. Why? Because the priesthood of man that looked forward, the priesthood of Aaron that looked forward to Jesus has ended. Do you understand what I'm saying? Like Zechariah is an order of the priests of Aaron. They have been offering sacrifices for about 1,500 years, like 100, 1,400 and some odd years. They've been offering sacrifices. And it, it, all those sacrifices looked forward to Jesus. All the sacrifices looked forward to the coming of the Messiah. And when the Messiah came, what did he do? He lived a perfect life, which is given to you by faith. 
And then he died a death that he did not deserve, taking your sins upon him, right? But then what does he do after he <coughs> dies and goes? Um, he goes to the grave, rises from the dead. The writer of Hebrews says he is the high priest and he goes into the heavenly temple. And he, see, here's the deal. Look, this is like theology. So this, this will help if you think about it. Okay. If Jesus died on Calvary in like 27 AD, it's probably around 27, 26, 27 he dies he di and sheds his blood on the cross and he dies for all of our sin and he is the God man, then he can die for all of the sin that's ever been committed. But all of us are sunk because we came after. Do you understand what I'm saying? You understand? It's like, it's like saying, I mean, uh, the other day, the other day, I, I was like invited to a meal for a bunch of people, and they closed it 30 minutes early. I showed up after the meal, right? My defense, they closed it 30. I actually, I went back and read. They closed it 30 minutes early. There's no meal. <clears throat> There'd be nothing. We came after. Except Jesus did not offer his blood in the earthly temple. He offered his blood in the heavenly temple. That's what he, the author of Hebrews tells us. Jesus ascends to heaven and offers his blood on the real heavenly temple. Well, where does God dwell? Where does God live? Where does he dwell? I'd like to think it's Texas, but it's actually not. But it's not a trick question. Where does God live? Heaven. And God, where does he dwell in time? Outside. What's that? Outside of time. He, the Bible says he dwells in eternity. I mean, there's a whole lot to this, but like God actually created time. Okay? He's outside of time. He dwells in eternity. Now, when Jesus goes to the heavenly temple where God dwells and offers his blood on that altar, it applies to everyone in all of time. It's all of time, all of space. There's so, you know, what that means, you come to faith in Jesus and your sins are forgiven. Well, what about the sins that you commit the next day? Well, those were forgiven. That blood was applied to sins that you have not yet committed. You're going to be like 55 years old. And you're going to do some sin. You're going to feel bad about it. And you're going to think, like, Christ's blood was applied to my sin. Already, it's there. Christ's blood is, in a sense, there waiting for your sin. What Zechariah was doing was making offerings that were looking forward to the coming of Christ. And once Christ comes, that old priesthood is dead because that priesthood is an earthly priesthood. Does that make sense? So in a sense, Gabriel says, Zechariah, you're fired. But more, you're not really fired, you're retired. Because you're the last one. And actually, I mean, don't feel that bad. Because God chose you to be the final priest. You're faithful. You know, I mean, yeah, you blew it with this one last thing. Because that's what all earthly priests do. Okay, so now think about that for a second. Okay. Um, I am a pastor and I'm a father. I'm a teacher. I tell people about Jesus. It's my son. I tried to tell my kids about Jesus. My kids, let's just keep this in here. Right? My kids can tell you about me sinning. I have not hidden it from them. Kind of tried, hasn't worked. I said so the person who's told them about Jesus <clears throat> has also sinned, not only sinned, I've sinned against him. Okay? Zach is a great guy. And I don't know him well enough to like start detailing his sins, but I know his humanity. And so I can tell you that Zach has sinned. He sinned against his wife. If you've been in the youth group long enough, he's sinned against you in some kind of way. 
All right, well, Pastor Gay. Pastor Gay, Pastor Gabe's a great guy. He has a PhD. Blah, 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 blah. But I bet if we were to talk to his children, they could say, I, uh, he, he has sinned. Okay? So, no, and your mom, grandma, my grandmother, it's hard. It's hard for me to accept that my, for me that my grandmother sinned, but I did see her sin twice. <laughs> like and, and, it, and it was it was like it, it wasn't like a like oh just kind of inadvertent. I only like I watched my grandmother twice in my life just stick it. <laughs> like I'm gonna sin in front of all of you. Bam! You know? <laughs> like, oh that's uncomfortable. I'm not seeing grandma do that, right? She was a believer. And yet still, she said, look, you, almost all of you, if not all of you, are here because your parents brought you. Your parents have been sharing Jesus with you. Your parents have been bringing you to church where other people talk about Jesus to you. Your parents have been playing the role of Zechariah and Elizabeth in your life. <clears throat> and it's not that their priesthood isn't valid. It's that it's not ultimate. It's not the final thing that you need. What's the final thing that you need? You need the priesthood of Jesus. It is not enough to have the priesthood of Travis or Zach or Gabe or mom or dad, you know, any of that. It's not enough. You must have our job is to bring you to Jesus and lose our job. Do you understand? You must have the priesthood of Jesus Christ. That's what Christmas is about. That everything good you have is not enough. You must have Christ. You must have, and if you have him, his sacrifice will cover all of your sin. If you have him, he is actually sinless. And when you realize that we're unreliable, and that's a very discouraging thing. It's a discouraging thing for your earthly priest to be unreliable. When you realize that we're unreliable, you need to turn to Jesus and say, he is absolutely reliable. As a matter of fact, my parents and my pastor and my teachers and everybody else need Jesus just as much as I do. But I need Jesus. They are not enough. I'm not enough. Christ is enough. And I want to encourage you because you, I mean, you, Go to a great youth group. I think we got a great church here. Any of you, I mean, some of you go to Christian schools. And you're, you're getting it all the time. And it's only meant to bring you to Jesus. None of it is meant to replace him. You need the priesthood of Jesus. And when they received Christ's blessing, what did they do? They rejoiced and went back to the temple and worshipped because they got it. Because he was their priest. Does that make sense? I think I'm supposed to let you know. The adults, I have to run up to the wire. Oh, yeah, a minute. But I want to pray. Heavenly Father, pray the priesthood of your son to be applied to all of my young friends in this room. Pray that you would open their hearts, you would show them their need as you have shown me mine, and that you would show them the wondrous grace of Jesus, our great high priest. Pray that you would do this in the name of our King. Amen. Amen.